Hey folks, this is Cal Lycus, and in this video we're going to be looking at some mixing techniques using pink noise. Let's get into it. So I suppose one of the first questions we kind of should be answering in this tutorial is what is pink noise? What's the difference between pink noise and white noise? Uh, what is noise in general? Um, things like that. So yeah, well, let's get straight into that. So what I've done here to demonstrate this is uh, I'm using a pulverized setup. Um, I have on the, the color of the noise uh, envelope here, or oscillator rather, I have uh, selected the pink noise. Uh, we have white, we also have brown, I think that's a purple, and we have blue, um, but I have selected the pink noise. Uh, I've turned the other oscillators off. And then what's important is that in our timeline, we have uh, just any note because noise isn't pitch uh, related. So we can just place it on any note and that is constant across the whole piece here. Now, uh, if I just set up a quick loop region, let's do that. Now, if I set this up and I solo that pink noise, here's what we get. Now, if I switch this to white noise, so you should be able to hear the difference there. Uh, if you can't hear much of a difference, it's probably more to do with your uh, monitoring equipment, so whether your headphones, uh, speakers, whatever you're using, um, but that's the most likely reason. Uh, there is a possibility that it could be to do with your ears as well, but for those of you that might struggle to hear that difference or naturally pick up on that difference, uh, let me visually demonstrate this difference for you with uh, an FFT here. So I've just turned this onto post. It doesn't really matter. Let's just turn these dots off so they're out of the way. And then I'll just run the, uh, the noise still on the white noise now through this FFT. And this is what it will look like. So we can see we had a fairly consistent uh, line. It was obviously above the zero mark, but it was a fairly consistent line. Lots of little bumps, but generally speaking, fairly straight. Uh, what this essentially means is that white noise is equal amplitude across all frequencies. So every frequency in that spectrum there had the same amplitude. Pink noise, however, is equal amplitude across all octaves. So what that looks like is this. So what we had there was a, a slight slope. So we had more lows and less highs. So I'll show you one more time. So the result that we get from this is something that's actually, generally speaking, a lot more pleasant to the ear than what we get from white noise. Uh, it follows more closely to some of those uh, listening curves that we were um, talking about in other videos. Um, where we struggle to hear lower frequencies. Uh, generally speaking, humans will struggle to hear those lower frequencies. So by having um, a, a boost on those lower frequencies, it just feels naturally more equal rather than this really harsh, tinny sound of, of white noise. This has this much warmer kind of sound. Now, the reason we're going to then use that is because it's more similar to something that we naturally want to hear or... Uh, that seems more naturally pleasing to our ear, rather. If we use that as a reference point when we're mixing, what happens is we can um, set levels uh, for each element of our mix across all of this, um, the frequency spectrum here. We can set levels uh, for each of these instruments that then correlate to that pink noise shape. Um, and this gives us a rough idea of, you know, something that might be pleasing to the ear. And then we can tweak that as and when, uh, or as and how, I suppose, we want to based on taste, on genre, things like that. Now, I, I wouldn't suggest doing this pink noise method uh, that I'm about to demonstrate in a second as a uh, way of, you know, mixing a track and then leaving it at that. I definitely would always do this as a, right, this is how I quickly get some levels, 
maybe do a bit of EQing and then I'll come back and I'll tweak the levels afterwards again just to really get everything dialed in how I want it. But especially if you have a much, much bigger track, uh, this is a really quick and easy way to get those rough levels sorted um, so that you're not spending hours and hours trying to, you know, get that perfect level of the kick and make sure it can still be heard next to the snare and the bass and things like that. Um, so before I get stuck into this any further, I uh, just want to say a big thank you to uh, Hurricane for um, lending me, I guess, the uh, the track here. This is uh, his track Multitude, which I reached out and asked if I you know, could do a, a mix of for this video. So yeah, again, thank you for, for lending me the track for the purpose of this. So what I'm going to do is um, essentially I have this pink noise set. As I said, I have it set up across the whole track. I am going to pick a busier section of the track. So let's go for something. Let's probably go for maybe here. That looks like it's one of the busier sections. So I'm going to choose this busy section here and then um, mix this first. And then I'll go and mix the intro and then I'll, I'll go from there. And essentially, I've set the level of the uh, the pink noise at minus nine decibels. I sent, basically what I've done is I've played it and then I've adjusted the fader for the pink noise so that uh, it's it's coming out at a decent level on, uh, on the master up here. So what it will look like. So it's coming out at minus six. Now, of course, I do have the plus six dB boost that I like to do for my uh, mixing um, so that uh, this is going to actually be nearer to uh, minus 12 um, realistically once this comes off. But essentially, I'm doing this at, at minus six, which gives me a bit of headroom then for when I want to start you know, lifting any of these faders up after I turned off the pink noise. It gives me a bit of space. So what I'm going to do, and solo that, just going to uh, quickly reset all of these back down to zero. What I should probably do is um, talk a little bit about what I've done with this track to get it ready for mixing um, as well. Um, so, yeah. So what I've done for this track to get it ready for mixing is... Uh, created two different groups so I have a drum centroid and then I have a, um, a bus for uh, instruments uh, if I had vocals I would also have another centroid that would have them vocals and then I've taken both of these and I'm running them both into uh, this centroid here which is my um, submix so I'm just going to quickly rename that now with the drums, the original drums all came in one um, audio track, and then there was a little fill, and there was some percussion that's, uh, that Hurricane had run through a pulsar delay, which I quite liked, so I kept that on. Um, however, having everything in one drum track doesn't really give me a lot of control when it comes to mixing those drums, um, so to give myself a bit more control, I've then uh, added my own drums as well, so I have some recordings that I... Um, put together and I grabbed a kick, a snare, a couple of hats out of those, put them into a machiniste. Uh, I then used the same um, drum pattern that he already had. So my drum pattern uh, is essentially following his original one, uh, you know, trying to emulate different velocities of, of the hi-hats and things like that. And then uh, after doing that, I just went in, panned the uh, the two hats slightly left because uh, on the original drum piece, the, his hats are also slightly off to the left in the recording. So I decided to do the same thing. Uh, I'm just going to zero these and do that a little later. Um, and then everything else, basically everything just has its own channel. Uh, it has EQ... Uh, on here which I can use uh, or I can do any extra EQing on here um, and then I've removed all of the reverb that he had placed on any of these instruments uh, I will 
in another video, look at using reverb on auxiliary sends uh, to bring that kind of uh, room tone or room space back into the mix later. All right, so there's probably enough talking. Let's just get into the mix. So essentially what I'm going to do is talk a little bit more, apparently, um, but I'm just going to hit play, have this pink noise going, and then I'm just going to bring up faders uh, one by one and soloed until I can just about hear them over the top of the pink noise. And then I know that the um, the frequencies that those instruments are bringing forward are slightly, but again, only slightly, louder than the um, frequency uh, either side of it in the pink noise, which then means that any masking is less likely to be occurring uh, unless I have a lot of clashing frequencies uh, within the mix as well. But we'll have a look at that in another video. So let's get started. Okay, so what I'm doing here now is slowly bringing up the faders on individual tracks. Uh, these tracks are being soloed so that I can hear only that instrument. And then I'm bringing that instrument up, uh, as I said, slowly so that I essentially try to make it so that I can only just hear it over the top of the pink noise. Um, so realistically, you could kind of start anywhere because you're soloing these instruments. You don't, you're not working on mixing them together. You're just working on getting a rough level um, for each instrument based on the pink noise as a reference point. Um, but starting at a place that you're kind of familiar with, uh, whether that's just starting on the left hand side and then just working across like I'm going to do here, or whether that's starting with uh, drums, so maybe you start with your kick, then maybe you start uh, with the snare, then the bass, make sure those are sorted, and then maybe you look at the vocals next, that kind of thing. Um, but typically that sort of mixing is what you would do next. So once we have finished doing uh, this kind of thing with the pink noise, I would then go back and start adjusting these things to taste, starting with the drums, moving now on to you know, bass, maybe the snare, any vocals, if I have vocals, and, and just sort of picking the, the most important instruments as I go along. Um, of course, I am going to have to flick back and forth between different sections of the track because sometimes there are instruments playing in some areas, uh, sometimes they're not playing in others. Uh, there's uh, at least one sort of cymbal riser effect um, at one point that is only playing at this one point, so I will have to you know, find that within the, the track and, and play that part of the arrangement a couple of times just so I know where that is. Similarly, I'm going to have to loop that section with the, the drum fill and play that a few times um, just so that I have an idea of, of what that sounds like in the mix. Uh, I'm not going to you know, play you know, 24 bars or however many bars, 32 bars or something and, and only hear that little fill three or four times and, and be able to you know, know that I've definitely got it in the right place as against this pink noise. Um, so I will have to you know, move around a little bit in the track and uh, keep being uh, fairly flexible uh, as I go along. One of the downsides to this particular uh, method um, is that the, the pink noise is not yeah, whilst it is more comfortable than white noise to listen to, it's not great fun to listen to for any particular length of time. Hence, I'm doing this little voiceover part here, so then you don't have to listen to it for five minutes uh, while I uh, actually do the mixing. But yeah, in, in essence, um, it, you know, it, it shouldn't take you too long to, to get done. Make sure you're doing it at a decent level, so that you know, as in volume for your output, so that you can actually hear what's happening um, as, as things you know, as you do bring up any of those instruments, you want to be able to hear them at some point, um, but you also don't want to, you know, deafen yourself and, and strain your ears and cause any particular fatigue or anything like that by um, listening to the, the, the noise on a constant loop for a particularly long time. Uh, it's probably a good idea once you've done this, just to take a bit of a break, let your ears sort of recalibrate, you know, sit in a quiet room or something like that, just to sort of let them um, rest for a moment before you then get stuck back into the mix and, and moving on to the next part of the, the mixing process. That's probably all I've got to say on on the matter uh, at this point. Uh, everything else I'm going to cover in a second once the, the mix is complete. Uh, I hope this is you know quite clear to you as to what I'm doing. 
Um, you know, it's essentially each instrument has its own place in the frequency spectrum and I'm trying to make sure that each instrument then is at the correct level within that frequency spectrum um, so that they're all roughly equal and then I will adjust them uh, depending on taste and genre, things like that as I mentioned earlier and as I'm sure I'm going to mention again uh, yeah, I'll be playing around with that kind of stuff in other videos and uh, you know, in the future of the mix, essentially. Okay, so that should be done. So the way this now sounds, let's give this a quick run through the... I'm just going to skip through different sections of this, but the way it sounds... Yeah, so to me, that's that's not a bad starting point. That's actually a, um, that's actually a really good starting point. Uh, the drums could definitely do with a little bit of work just to make sure that they fit a little bit more subtly into the mix. Um, but again, that will be worked on when we look at doing uh, some reverb type stuff on auxiliary sounds. Um, we could look at putting some delay on a few of the other little bits and pieces on the, the instrument side of things. Um, if there were vocals going on this, that'd be another layer that we could add uh, later on in the future, which would, again, start to play around with that. Um, but EQ is going to be a big thing now to make sure that the, the, the kick doesn't uh, mess around with the bass and things like that. But we'll look at that in other videos. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. Hope it's been really helpful. And hopefully this technique will give you an idea of how to get a quick rough and ready mix going. Um, yeah, keep producing. Cheers.